the copyrighted program created by Rio Grande. San Bernardino Sheriff's Office calling all cars, attention all San Bernardino, San Bernardino Sheriff's Car to broadcast 211 regarding a dead body in the desert near Langford Swell. That's all. Rules of Christmas. Officers of the law conduct many a secret investigation, but it is no secret as to what takes them there and brings them back with maximum speed, safety, and economy. Everyone on the Pacific Coast knows by this time that it is Rio Grande cracked gasoline that spins the wheels of more police cars, ambulances, fire engines, and other public service cars wherever it is sold than any other brand. Yes, most of the drivers of emergency cars use Rio Grande cracks exclusively, but they are not the only ones. Countless thousands of motorists also have discovered that this really superior gasoline starts more quickly, delivers smoother acceleration, and more miles with greater reserve power and speed. You needn't envy your neighbor. If you want police car performance for your car, follow that neighbor into the nearest red and white Rio Grande station tomorrow morning and get it. Take on a tank full of Rio Grande cracks, and you will understand why this finer motor fuel is the most highly recommended gasoline in the West. For fuller measure, more complete motoring pleasure, get Rio Grande cracked gasoline. pleasure to present a message from the Sheriff of San Bernardino County, Emmett L. Shea. Thank you, Dr. Lindsley. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Today, throughout all the far-flung territory that comprises California, there is not a single outpost of the law where out-of-date police methods are involved. Today, the San Bernardino Sheriff's Office, of which I have the honor to be the head, is in common with every other law enforcement office in the state, equipped and alert to meet the best of the worst in criminal elements. Crimes today are, of course, the same as they were years ago. Murder is still murder. But no longer does the sheriff gallop forth at the head of a posse to track his man through the trackless desert, but scientific methods are employed to bring the criminal to justice. Perseverance, patience, and intelligent deduction, coupled with expert analysis, contributed to the solution of the case we are about to hear. <laughs> Sheriff, this is Jim Lucas, out of Daggett. Oh, yes, Jim. Hi. Fine. Uh, say, Walter, a couple of kids riding on top of an old prospector's wagon came through here a little while ago and said they saw a man lying back at some mesquite bushes out close to Langford's well. Well, that's about 25 miles northeast of where you are now, isn't it? That's right. When did they make this time? Just a few hours ago. Just? No. Club. Where? Hard to say, exactly. Must be quite a spell back, though. Maybe a month. No, not for a couple of months. No dust storms either. Oh, that's good. You left the body there, of course. Right where it was found. Fine. I'll round up some of the boys and be right out. Oh, and Jim, you better meet us at Jackson so you can show us where the body is. All right, Walter. I'll be ready for you. <laughs> Across the vast expanse of a county that is almost half the size of the entire state of New York, Sheriff Kay piloted his men. Northward, over historic El Cajon Pass, over which early-day Mormons had driven ox carts into the fertile San Bernardino Valley, past picturesque Victorville, sleeping beside the meandering Mojave, and out into a dusty road that leads to Langford's well. Right over there, behind that second clump of bushes. Oh, yeah. Wait a minute. You see those two fellows? 
Looks like the man was killed here on the road and dragged over there. Yeah. Guess his heels made those marks. Uh, here's a big patch of blood. Looks like the killer rested a while here. Must have been a fairly small man. Uh, how do you know? Well, I looked at the body this morning, and the fellow wasn't very big himself. Well, anyway, we know that two men could have carried the body. Must have been just one man in on the job. That's what I figured. Oh, uh, is this the body? Yeah. What there is left of it. Oh, no dental work to furnish any clues. Figure he'd weigh about 135 pounds, wouldn't you, Jim? Just about. Well, hey, Emmett. Yeah? Have Butterwell bring his camera over here. And the rest of you boys can be looking the ground over. Make a circle out about 100 yards and don't miss anything. All right, Dad. Well, Jim, you better write down a list of these clothes and things. I'll call them off to you. All right, go ahead. Blue thread suit. Suit. Knitted sweater. I meant... I got it. White shirt. No collar. No collar. No tie. Brown yes. socks. Tan shoes. Yes. Any labels in the clothes? No. Not a one. Say, Dad, I... Picked up all around here. Apparently, the man was killed in a car and then dragged over here. There's no blood where the heel tracks begin. Find anything in the pocket? No, not a thing. Well, here, wait a minute. Wait a minute. There's something down in the front of the watch pocket. Yeah. Huh. Well, a piece of notepaper looks like. There's some printing on the other side. Yeah, it looks like a sheet off of a memo pad. Yes, sir. That's just what it is. Came from the security state bank out in Utah. Well, it looks like there are some notes and some figures on here, too. I can't make them out, though. How about you, Emma? Well, let me see. So, I can do it, Dad. Guess we better take it back and look at it under a good magnifying glass. Yep. Guess that's the best. Well, let's get busy and bury this fellow. Don't want to take any more chances on losing any other identification that might be here. <laughs> that with the month's headway, the chances of escape for the criminal were 1,000 to 1. Sheriff Kay and his men set to work to establish the identity of the victim. And a tie to the slender thread of a clue the train of circumstances of his death. What have you found on that paper, Emmett? Well, besides a lot of figures I can't read, there seems to be a complete set right there on the back. Let's see. Hmm. 87, 79. Well, that might mean anything. That's right. But since this is a bank memo, I'd figure they meant that much money. Well, that's a natural assumption. Yeah, but that doesn't bring us any nearer solution of the case than we were before. Well, I'm not so sure about that. So what do you mean? I'm going up to Ogden and see what I can find out from the Security State Bank. <laughs> you think they'll be able to recognize this memo sheet? Well, maybe not, but then again, they might. It's a chance. But this is the only clue we have. We might as well work on it. I know I'm not going to pass it up. Well, I uh, wish you luck, Dad. Thanks, son. And keep an eye on things while I'm gone. <laughs> May I help you? Well, yes. I'm looking for the president of this bank. Why, well, he's not here right now. He's going to lunch. Probably won't be back for two hours, so. Maybe I can help you. Well, maybe. I'm uh, Walter Shea, sheriff of San Bernardino County down in California. Well, how do you do, sir? I'm George Dye, cashier of the bank. Well, maybe you can help me with that. You see, we had a little killing down in our neck of the woods some time back. Found out about it just after Christmas. Well, we haven't got hide nor hair or of a clue as to who committed the murder. The only thing we found was this little piece of paper. Now, where did I put that? Oh, ah, there it is. You ever see a piece of paper like that? Hmm? Uh, yeah. Why, yes, of course. That's one of our memos. We keep them right here on the counter for the customer to use. I see. Yep, the same kind, all right. Well, that means our man was here recently, doesn't it? Yeah, I imagine it does. We got the last shipment of these pads about June. That was the first time that we'd used this particular kind. There's a set of figures on the back right here. 87, 79. Now, I know it's asking a lot, but is there a possibility that those figures mean anything to you? Uh, let me see. Uh, well, I, I don't know about the other writing, but Mr. Stevens, the bank president, definitely wrote those figures down for one of the customers. And I've got to know which customer. Those figures look familiar. Well, let me think. No... No, that wouldn't be the one. Let's see. Why, George, I do remember something about that. Seems to me I remember a transaction involving that amount. Uh, it was right around the holiday. Now, let me think. Let's see, there was Christmas. Before that was Thanksgiving. Then back farther was Armistice Day. Yeah, that's it. Right around the early part of November. Uh, do you remember who the customer was? Well, he wasn't exactly a customer. You see, this man came in and Mr. Stevens took care of him. 
As I recall it, he had a bank account back east somewhere, and, well, he wanted to transfer his funds out here. He was just passing through here. Said he'd become stranded. It was a telegraphic transfer, if I remember rightly. Do you happen to remember the name? No, not offhand, but I could check up on it. I'll tell you what it will do. We'll call the telegraph office and ask them to go through their files of a couple of months ago. And maybe we can get a double check on it. Judy State Bank, Di speaking. We found a couple of letters about transferring funds to your bank. One was sent on November 10th. Have you got it there? Yes. Shall I read it? If you will, please. It says, Telegraph Security State Bank, Austin, Utah, balance of my account. It's signed with Wilson Hayes. Hey, is that the name? Yes. The wire went to People's State Bank in Detroit, Michigan. We have a copy of your trial on that. It says, Cannot transfer funds without possible. Anything else? Thanks a lot. Well, there's your man's name, Wilfred Hayes. Let's see, we should have a receipt for the money in this trial right here. Harris, Harrison, Harvey, Hemp. Hey, here it is. Wilfred Hayes. Received the Security State Bank, Ogden, Utah, $87.79 in telegraphic transfer of funds at request of People's State Bank, Detroit, Michigan. Mm-hmm. Happen to remember what this fellow looked like? Well, yes. Uh, you see, this business was a little out of the ordinary, and I noticed the man rather closely. He had reddish brown hair, as I recall. Uh, must have weighed around, oh, 130 or 140. Rather slight. Had long, tapering fingers. Seemed rather refined. Had on a blue serge suit, I believe. Say what his business was? Yes, I, I believe he said he was a printer. Going west to look for a job. That sounds like the man we found, all right. Do you remember if he was alone? No, I don't think so. It seems there was another fellow with him. I didn't have any conversation or any dealings with him, though, so well, I didn't pay particular attention to him. Seems like he was smooth-shaven, seemed sort of quiet and reserved. I noticed that he did pay pretty close attention when he mentioned some British war bonds he owned. You don't happen to know where Hay lived while he was here, do you? Well, he gave us the address of the Grand Hotel. Now, you might talk to Sheriff Tennant. He might have a line on him. Well, thanks, Mr. Dyer. Sheriff, I'm Walter Chase from San Bernardino, California. I'm checking up on a couple of boys that came through here about the first of last month. A fellow named Hay and another fellow named Watts. Oh, uh, let me see. I got a list of most of the people who come in contact with in the past few weeks. Uh, let's see. Uh uh-huh. Yep, yep, here it is. Hey, young fella. About 30. Right to pick him. That's the one. Watts was with him. He told me the car was broken down. Headed out of Roden's garage to Washington Avenue. can I do for you? I'm Sheriff Shea. Oh, yeah. Sheriff Pinnock phoned me you were coming out. Yes. I'm taking up on a chap named Hay and another named Watts. Remember him? Yeah. Besides, my book will show the job I did for him. I looked him up after Pinnock phoned me. Here's the answer right here. Hmm. November 9th, J.H. Watts. All right. See, you lent him five dollars on the car. Yeah, you said he needed the money to buy food for wife and baby. Here's a guess. You don't have any record of a woman in this case. He wanted 25 bucks. Did he get it next day from Wyoming? I let him have five and stuck it on the bill. Well, what kind of car was it? Small Oakland touring car. Watts had a bill of sale to it. He come in again the day or two and picked it up. Recall how this man Watts looked? Well, uh, I'd say he was five, nine, or ten inches tall. I guess he weighed around 160, 165 pounds, maybe a little more. A uh, smooth shaven? Yeah, I believe it was. Light or dark? Dark. Straight black hair. Athletic build or slight? Mm, decidedly athletic. I think I'll start looking for that young man. Gallery, we 
returned to his office in San Bernardino and immediately contacted Captain of Detectives Edward Fox of Detroit, asking his assistance in tracing the movements of Hay and Watts. Walk shows as his starting point the People's State Bank in Detroit. Uh, I've got a letter here from the Sheriff of San Bernardino County out in California asking for some information on a man who used to do business with his bank. Uh, his name is Hay. Know anything about him? Yes, yes, a great deal. Uh, we received a letter from the Sheriff, too. They had to sell quite a large quantity of war bonds to him some time ago. He had a note here for about $20. He paid that off when he got the money from the bonds and opened the savings account. According to our records, he left about $100 in that account and left for California. Did you hear anything more about him after that? Yes, yes, we got several telegrams about his account and finally transferred his balance of $87.79 to Ogden. Uh, where do your records show Hay lived while he was here? Well, the address he gave us was 1368 Perry Street. Uh-huh. I think I'll run over there and see what the landlady might know. <laughs> Are you, Mrs. Forrest? Uh, yes. Uh, I'm looking for information on a chap named Hay. Well, I haven't seen Mr. Hay since, uh, let me see. Must be the latter part of October. Uh, what sort of fellow was he? Well, he was a quiet sort of boy. An uh, Englishman, I believe. Had been a soldier during the war. He was a printer, he told me. How long did he live here? Mm, he moved in uh, about the 1st of July, I believe. He lived alone in the front room there for some time around the middle of the last part of September. He brought a Mr. Watts in with him one night and told me he'd be staying in his room for a while. Did uh, Watts pay any of the room rent? No. I got the impression that this Watts boy was broke. I let him stay here, and Mr. Hay paid the extra rent himself. And uh, when did you say he left? Just about the last of October. He left in a car with this man at Watts. Uh, uh, Kalamazoo Apartment. Uh, uh, just a minute. Uh, it's for you. Please. Uh, thanks. Fox speaking. Well, you can see that. People stay trapped. Oh, yes. Uh-huh. That's so. Well, I'm glad to get that. I'll keep that dope over to Sheriff Kate. Uh, thanks for calling. Look, Emmett, I've got an idea about this case. If he wired it all to that Detroit bank, he would have done it from close by the bank. Let's go in here and check with the telegraph office. Okay. Well, maybe we're police officers. We're trying to check a telegram we think might have been sent from here on November the 29th of last year. Can you see if you've got a record of it? Sure. Uh, 26, 27, 8, November 29th. Now, do you need a telegram sent? People's State Bank, Detroit, Michigan. Sent by a fellow named Hay. Mm-hmm. Here we are. Mm-hmm. Transfer all funds, account Wilfred Hay. Bank of Italy, seven cent dollars, Los Angeles. Thanks, Miss. That helps a lot. You know, said that name was Hay, didn't you? That's right. Well, our records show that on December 1st, one of our customers introduced a Mr. Hay who opened an account by transferring some funds from the bank in Detroit. That's the one. How much money was it? About $1,100. So all charges have been deducted. So what address did he give? 1201, late in way. When was he in here last? Uh, hey, I mean. Uh, I don't know. Made a $900 withdrawal on December 8th. Is that the last transaction on that account? Uh, let me see. Uh, no, there's a check paid on the 12th. It shows a date of December 9th. It's endorsed by a man at Carruthers. Not of here. Well, that would indicate that Hay was alive on December 9th, Emmett. Yes, and I don't believe it. Neither do I. That body has been out there for at least a month when we found it. Who was this customer who introduced Hay to you? man by the name of Watt. R.W. Watt. Same address as Hay. Watt, sir. What did this Watt fellow look like? About five feet nine or ten inches tall. Weighed he guts around 160, 165 pounds. Smooth shaven. Straight black hair. Sort of round face. Rather athletic build. Hmm. Well, I think I'll go over to that Leighton Street address. <laughs>
But the sheriff's check on the Layton address netted only the information that a man by the name of Watts had lived there, but had left sometime in December. At the Los Angeles Post Office, Shave found a change of address directing that mail addressed to the Layton Way House be forwarded to Lancaster, Pennsylvania. But the sheriff reasoned that this address was a blind and proceeded on the theory that the check forwarded from Carruthers indicated the true trail of the fugitive. Laid plans for his capture. Emmett, yes? send that photographer in here, will you? Right away. Somebody take you, Jack? Yes. First, ask Emmett to swear out our murder complaint charging J. H. Watts with the murder of Wilfred Hay. Send a wire to the chief of police in Boston. Right. Ask him to check up on the address we got on Watts. Mm-hmm. Have the Lancaster, Pennsylvania police investigate him there. Okay. And ask them to watch the post office. Anything else? Yes, get a wire off to the motor vehicle department. Ask them to check up on that oval and through the out of state registration. You better get a letter off to Sheriff Jones up in Fresno, too. Ask him to find out from that fellow Thomas at Carruthers about that check he cashed for Hayes. Mm-hmm. Get him to have Thomas describe the man. You really let me search for this, so I am you, Sheriff. Mm. I have a pack of bulletins printed, giving a complete description of what. Send them out to all the places up and down the coast. Right. With an special supply to San Francisco and the Bay District. What else? Well, I guess that ought to keep them busy for a while. Within a few days, word came from San Francisco that a man answering Watt's description had cashed a check at a restaurant, giving the name of Craiger. San Francisco officers took up the hunt in earnest. Detective Sergeants Kalmbach and Richards on a chance stakeout were making the rounds of the branch post offices as well as the main San Francisco office. One day, late in February, they were scanning the faces of patrons at the general delivery window when... Anything for Jimmer James Kreger? How do you spell it? C-R-E-G-G-E-R. James Kreger. Here's one letter. Thanks. All right, Kreger. Under arrest. Says who? We do. Please, officers, you. Yeah, what's the idea? A little item of murder, San Bernardino. You're making a big mistake, mister. I haven't ever been in San Bernardino. Well, maybe not. We think you're J.H. Watt. We think you have been in San Bernardino. Anyway, that's where you're going. Watt was returned to San Bernardino County, and legal machinery began to turn to bring him to trial. Although he admitted his name and that he knew Wilfred Hayes slightly, he stoutly maintained his innocence. On April 10th, he was brought to trial. District Attorney George Johnson presented a veritable parade of witnesses. Your name is Sellers? Yes, Clark Sellers. You're an expert in comparing handwriting? I am. I show you samples of handwriting of the defendant Watts and of the victim Wilfred Hay. I will ask you if you've examined them. I have. And what did you find? Well, the handwriting of the man Hay is the same as that found in the hotel register in Ogden and on the telegram sent from Ogden. It is in no way similar to that of Watts. Is the handwriting of Watts similar to that found in the check marked Exhibit B and cashed in Carruthers, California, on December 9th? It is. This signature, on this check, signed in San Francisco, bearing the name Hayes, and the endorsement Craig. Is it the signature of Wilfred Hayes? No, it is not. It is identical with the handwriting of J.H. Watts. That's all. Mr. Silloway? Mr. Silloway, uh, you were employed by the Western Union Telegraph Company? Yes. At all of them, in Los Angeles. Do you recognize the defendant, Watt? Yes, sir. He is a man who sent the telegram to the Detroit Bank. Thank you. That's all. Dr. Levin. Dr. Levin, you made spectrographic and microscopic tests of sand taken from the scene where the body of Wilfred Hay was found? Yes, I did. And did you make similar analysis of sand taken from the clothing of the defendant, Watt? I did. And were they similar? They were identical. Thank you. That's all. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris, will you tell the court and jury just what happened in relation to the defendant now on trial on the evening of November 24th last? Well, I was on my way to Las Vegas to look at some mining property I have up there. My car broke down on the road about 20 miles west of Vegas. I stopped off at Silver Lake. A friend of mine lives there, runs a garage. I took care of his garage for him that night. Did you see the defendant on that night? Yes, sir. That evening, he walked into the garage and said he was out of gasoline. He stalled down the road a ways. I walked part of the way down the road with him. Did he have a companion in the car with him? Yes, sir. I saw a man in the car that answered the description the officers gave of this man, Hay. Did what say anything about this man? Well, he said, I'm riding with a dead one. Did you give any reason for this remark? No, sir. But you were sure that the defendant was in the company of a man who answered Hayes' description on the night of November 24th, and that this was at Silver Lake. Yes, sir, I am. Thank you. R.W. Watts. 
Mr. Watts, is the defendant J. H. Watts related to you? Yes. He's my brother. Did you at any time introduce your brother to any official of the Bank of Italy in Los Angeles? Yes. In December, my brother came to Los Angeles. He said he was driving his own car and wanted to cash some drafts on a bank back east. I introduced him to the bank, guaranteed his signature. What name did he use in opening this account? He used the name of Wilfred Hay. What reason did he give for using that name? He said he'd had some trouble back east. Domestic trouble. Wanted to use another name. Mr. Watt, what is your address at this time? San Quentin Penitentiary. And what is the reason for you being there? I was convicted in Los Angeles of grand larceny in connection with my brother's bank account. Thank you, Mr. Watt. That is all. Let us see. You are Walter Shea, Sheriff of San Bernardino County? I am. Have you seen the body of the man identified as Wilfred Hayden? I have. Upon what do you base your identification of this man? By a comparison of the handwriting on the sheet of memorandum paper found on the victim's body with specimens of his known writing. What other means? By a comparison of the victim's description as furnished by witnesses who knew him with that of the dead man. Then you can say positive. That the man whose body was found in the desert near Langford's well was Wilfred Hay? I can. That is all. Thank you. That is the people's case. We, the jury, find the defendant, J.H. Watt, guilty of murder in the first degree. Before we execute the sentence of the court, is there anything you'd like to say? Ah, get it over. Stand there. Rio Grande Crack is not a special privilege, gasoline. It is the specified choice of the officials of 30 leading cities and counties throughout California and is used exclusively to power their emergency cars. The very same Rio Grande Crack gasoline is available to every motorist in California. The same finer motor fuel that sped police cars and other public service equipment over 55 million miles of California highways through all the hardships and weather changes of a single year has won the loyalty and patronage of thousands of thinking motorists. I feel confident that Rio Grande Crack will win your approval, too, when you give it a trial. The same Rio Grande tank trucks you see pull into the garages of your police and fire department, serve the red and white Rio Grande station in your neighborhood with the same Rio Grande crash gasoline used to power emergency public service cars. That's why you too will begin getting police car performance for your car when you wheel in tomorrow morning and ask the friendly Rio Grande dealer for a tank full of Rio Grande crash. The gasoline preferred by officials for emergency cars. The gasoline preferred by a great army of motorists for all emergencies. On October 15th, two years after his crime, and after review by the state's highest court, Watts walked up the steps of the gallows of San Quentin, sent there by a wadded sheet of memorandum paper. Without an apparent qualm, he plunged through the trap, and the brutal murder of Wilfred Hay was avenged. Today, this case is referred to as an outstanding one covering the law of circumstantial evidence. San Bernardino Sheriff's Office calling all cars, attention all cars, to Camp Aiken Broadcast 211 regarding a dead body in the desert. The suspect in this case was hanged at San Quentin. That's all. Those who were. Frederick Lindsley, bidding you good night for Rio Grande.